Professor Layton and the Disappointing Daughter Level 5 recently closed its operations in its North America studio, and this also coincided with my recent playthrough of the latest Professor Layton game, Catriel and the Millionaire's Conspiracy. This game is by far the low point in the series, with the character of Catriel going in the face of seemingly everything a detective should be. I cannot tell if this is on purpose, but there is so much more wrong with this game than just that. I love the Professor Layton series. The first game, Curious Village, on the DS was a breath of fresh air, a very quirky mystery story revolving around the core gameplay of solving small puzzles, Charming hand-drawn Ghibli cutscenes, wonderfully strange characters, setting, mystery and tone, all wonderful. But to top it off, each of the puzzles are so fun, different and well crafted. The future games generally lose the spark regarding the puzzles with a lot of the answers generally following the same formula, but the story and the characters were still excellent with Unwound Future being a fantastic cap for the series. The future three games are generally not very good in my opinion, relying more on the fantastical elements than good characters or plot, whilst the first three games also had quite outlandish solutions to the big mysteries, the general plots are well paced, intriguing and at least follow the evidence given throughout the entire game. There are four crucial things that Millionaire's Conspiracy gets very wrong that make the whole experience very taxing. Structure setting, characters, and puzzles, though I would be very interested in how a complete newbie to the series would find this game. One of the biggest problems is how the game is split into smaller self-contained cases. Instead of one big sprawling mystery to gather information on, the game is split into 12 separate segments, with their own visitable locations and much smaller mysteries. Upon moving to the signposted location, you will receive a piece of crucial information you need to put together in a very simple jigsaw puzzle. Once you have six pieces, then you will automatically solve the puzzle, and Catriel will come out and explain the answer. The other games did similar things with a big unexplained occurrence uh, being shown in the diary, and then when it gets solved it becomes ticked off with an explanation, however these got to have some more mystique, more time to develop more red herrings, and generally more intricate and in-depth writing to flesh them out. Whereas the smaller cases of the newest game need to be solved in pretty much an hour. This leads to one of two things. Either the cases are bafflingly easy to solve, so much so that within the first or second clues you encounter, you have the outcome already in your head or the solution is so completely nonsensical and poorly laid out that you feel cheated upon learning the solution. For example, the Ratman case. Within the first five minutes, you are told that the newspaper does very well publishing the stories of Ratman, and that the editor has just had a baby, and you know that Ratman has disappeared. I'll let you put two and two together there. Or on the opposite end of the spectrum, you can have the ghost case, where you are requested to solve five different ghost sightings around a spooky mansion. You solve the individual strange occurrences by being a silhouette, or a balloon, or a recording, or some nonsense. It turns out the person who invited you to solve the mystery wanted to make a paranormal society so she could make friends. But why invite Catriel? Surely this goes in the face of everything you want to achieve. If the detective solves the mysteries, there are no mysteries, therefore no society. Uh, so they, so they designed the puzzles and idea of the setting without working it through for the characters' motivations. It's completely bizarre and it's really jarring. But that's not the first time this happens. The seeming lack of planning with how these cases would fit around the characters and the overall narrative really shows. The plot revolves around Leighton's daughter opening up a detective agency, and they are hoping to receive new cases and increase their reputation, but this doesn't align with the order the cases are shown in. The first case being quite enticing. The minute hand of Big Ben has gone missing overnight. It is laid out quite well, and I was intrigued. Soon after getting the 
awful solution to the mystery, it ruins the setup and the character's intentions, and makes the imposed time constraint seem stupid. Then, after a few more missions, you have a mystery where you must locate a missing pet. For a person who has barely any reputation or clients, it is completely bizarre to me that the police immediately come to Catriel for assistance in something on a nationwide crime level. And then a few missions later, you're finding a pet for someone. The pet mission would have been a far better introduction to the story. The puzzle isn't very difficult, but is at least laid out well for an opener. You gain respect with a wealthy and influential character in the story, and then you can be recommended to the police. It's quite jarring to bounce around from relatively serious crime to harmless conundrums in the space of a few hours, where it would have been a more natural fit for the cases to only increase in seriousness and status in line with the reputation of the detective agency. I find it strange that they even bothered with the weird jigsaw thing, as the puzzle isn't very difficult and you don't get to use that information to do any clever deductions of your own. Even slotting the information into a paragraph that explains the theory would have made you, the player, feel more clever and part of the mystery. What it would have benefited from would have been to have had a solution in the form of an actual puzzle so that you, the player, solves it, rather than Catriel thinks about the information for a bit and then solves it herself. There's quite this disconnect between the character of Catriel and the player. Finally on structure is that it starts quite linear, with the first three cases being regimented in a stringent order, and then it gives you six cases you can choose from after that. Now I wonder why they bothered opening it up to the player to choose, because each of these stories is very linear, every case is a point A to B to C. There is no deviation from this path at all, you have a goal right at the top of the screen and you have to follow it. If the map was fully open and explorable and you could make the deductions in a more open fashion, you would feel more like a detective. Since they reuse the locations and the characters a lot, it would be much more justifiable as a decision and work much better. A weird missed opportunity that I feel would have merged more of a sense of atmosphere with the mechanics. The first thing to point out is the setting of the game. It's just London, which on its surface isn't terrible. But when you have previous games with such fantastical settings, it really does become a detriment to the gameplay from a story perspective. Saint Mysterie in Curious Village. A puzzle-loving, secluded village with strange residents and a huge, oddly constructed tower in the centre of the town. The phantom town of Falsense, hidden on a disused train station stop. Future London and its bizarre mechanical scenery. Mist Hallery, a haunted fishing village with various legends and myths. Mont Dor, an oasis city that sprang to life in a desert 18 years prior with someone who can perform miracles. A globe-trotting adventure looking for an ancient civilization's clues. Compared to these, the general setting is just London. The Thames, Big Ben, your standard English tourist locales. Not only that, but there is a big problem where a lot of the backdrops and areas are reused between cases. Yes, they are nicely drawn, but there is no mystique to them. It's Tower Bridge, it's outside a bank, it's along the Thames or an English high street. A distinct lack of variation in the areas you inspect and solve mysteries in lead a lot of the game to feel quite mundane. Previous games had a lot of back and forth where you would backtrack to different areas in the location, but this is far more forgivable as these games had a whole setting as part of one mystery, where you felt like you were deducing the secrets and the mysteries in a bizarre location, which would involve discovering new areas and questioning the inhabitants. This is clearly hampered by the fact the game is split into smaller contained cases, so when areas get reused, they feel like they're cheaply cutting corners and making the player go through the same locations as a way of reducing the amount of assets needed. With the setting being good old London, you lose a bit of the player's suspension of disbelief with the puzzle aspect. In Professor Layton and the Curious Village, it's shown right up front that St Mysterie is a location where the inhabitants love puzzles. They love riddles and everything to do with them, and they are completely quirky and weird, so you can believe that people won't help you or answer your questions without solving a head-scratcher for them. Puzzles hidden in the background or general story-related puzzles make a lot more sense 
in St Mystere instead of London, as they feel quite ham-fisted in this current game. I know other late in games after the first one don't do too much in terms of making the puzzles seem believable, but the strange setting adds to the air that it is certainly possible. It feels quite awkward when you click on a bank teller's desk and they just say, oh, there's a puzzle here for you to solve. Or the standard English lady out for a stroll just has puzzles they need solving before they will answer any of your questions. I mean, Christ, how many times do we need to prove our mettle by solving a puzzle? It's quite repetitive and dull in this very bland setting. Whereas if you're in St Mystere, the essence of puzzles is baked so much into the culture of the village that it doesn't feel weird that you find puzzles in the scenery. You find puzzles that people are talking about. It's all they care about and they make it known. And so it feels believable. Whereas in London, it's just London. There's nothing... People in England don't just walk around wanting to solve puzzles. It's... They don't even make the effort to think it's just because the previous series did it that they think it's fine to do. It's, it's lazy. I tried to think of what makes a good detective character. And what I considered was just a good moral sense of justice and a want to help the little guy. Now, essentially, Catriel is so unlikable and completely the opposite of what I would consider a good character, let alone a detective character, that it's, it's bizarre that they even bothered going with this direction for this character's, you know, personality. Usually a detective solves crimes and mysteries for a sense of justice, as it's the right thing to do. Even dirty cops will bend the law to fit their form of what they believe is right. Catriel seemingly does not care about anyone or helping others. She only cares about herself, her bizarre ego and her daddy issues. I can't there are times where she does help people in the story, but it's by no means because she feels like she needs to help the person. Uh, it's, it's so bizarre, and it's played for laughs, and it shouldn't be. It is such a contrast to her father, Professor Layton, who is the quintessential English gentleman. He loves helping people no matter what, as that's what a good person would do, which makes sense with why he would help to solve all the puzzles. The two things I can glean from Catriel is that she's completely oblivious to other people's feelings and that she loves food, which is so cliche it hurts. And then you have her simp psychic Ernest who just wants to bang Catriel, that's, that's it. She saved him once but didn't do it out of kindness and he loves her for it? <laughs> okay, uh, we can, we'll get back to him later as he's a, a whole disaster in himself. And we have Sherl. O.C. Holmes, Ugh. a talking dog that exists only to speak to other animals and to be the anime trope of the character who overreacts to everything the main character says in a snooty way. Ugh. Really strong characters there, as a great team that works so well. Woo! And what makes it worse is how Catriel goes about solving cases. She uses gut instinct. She hasn't got enough evidence. I'll just go eat and let the clues come to me. It, it, it's baffling, as you, the player, feel as frustrated by this as the characters around her, and you can never really get a real grasp of the mysteries, as Deus Ex Machina over here will just solve them through nonsense logic. And to top it off, they have the gall in this game to give her a rival who specialises in using criminal profiling hard evidence and statistical analysis to deduce an answer. You know, a detective? They make her out to be snooty and up herself and dismissive of Catriel's brilliance. Even though she's completely right and should be the main character and Catriel should be thrown in prison for obstructing justice. It's it, oh, baffling again. Almost like the person who wrote this got told it was a dumb idea by someone and so in spite doubled down on it in an immature rage. She sucks as a main character and a detective and thus you can't relate to her or solve the mysteries as a vicarious player insert. Yes, Leighton and Luke were quite standard Holmes and Watson cliché character archetypes, but they were a cliché that works and fits well within the story. Some clichés are clichés for a reason and at least there was thought 
about how they fit into the story and setting. I want to point out as well, another annoying thing that Catriel does with her detective accusing the standard Agatha Christie right at the end, like, haha, I, it was you. She will say something like, I think you ran out of time and thus did this. There's no evidence, just a hunch. She just says this is what she believes. And then the criminal will just say, oh, yeah, you got me. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And it's... <sighs> It's because the story writers are brain dead chimps and can't even write a coherent and solvable mystery. Side note here with the characters is that probably only applies to the English version, but it must be some of the worst voice acting I've ever heard in a game. Honestly, it's it's like Mega Man ain't bad. Catrell and Ernest are passable. They feel wooden and robotic, but they're passable. Sherl is dreadful. It's not helped by the abysmal dialogue filled with cringeworthy dog puns, but it feels like they didn't even bother casting some of the characters, they just grabbed some of the localizers to do the lines in an afternoon. Some of the dragons are the worst, like Madame Duble is... <sighs> I mean, just listen. You must recover my dear lost Rexy Wexy post haste. Rexy Wexy? Sorry? Oh, my precious Rexy Wexy! Where have you gone? Whoa! I'm so worried! I can't sleep at night! Oh. The rest range from, like, they do the exaggerated English voices to just laughable, laughable voice acting. In the, in the final few chapters of the game, you are shown how Catriel and Ernest met and how she helped him out with a case in his university and how he eventually became working for her. Uh, okay, so... You get like the help and the bizarre backstory of Ernest and Catriel, which is awful and just shows the, the characters at their worst. Uh, and then you finally come to a mansion at the end of the game with all of the characters together. And for some reason, every character agrees to sign a contract that says if they can't solve a puzzle, they will lose their whole wealth. Uh, and okay, so these characters are the it's not like they're just wealthy people these like they're like the owners of london essentially these are the big dogs and they're just like yeah okay yeah sure whatever and so there's four rooms which means that there would definitely be someone who loses the money and they they just go yeah sure whatever it's, it's a lot of nonsense i really can't suspend my disbelief that these callous business people would would do this out of a sense of honor it, it, whatever Essentially, it all boils down to a strange plot by Ernest. Yep, the simp guy who has had no prior character development at all, apart from he went to university and got fucking fell into some fucking bushes or something. So it turns out he's actually the son of a really, really rich person who arranged a plot to take their money, but then was legally wrong and then legally right. And then no one cares because he's a good person. And honestly, at this point, I tuned out. I was, I was like, I was watching some really bad side, you know, cheap anime. I couldn't, I could not wait for this game to be over. There wasn't any character development. There wasn't any excitement. There wasn't any value of any kind to be taken from this game. Nobody learns anything. Any quote unquote changes happen because random new info was introduced right before the change. The status quo is kept. It's embarrassing. It's whoever wrote this story, man, it's 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 bad. Yeah, the story and setting are bad. The structure is a broken mess and the characters are an embarrassment. But if the core attraction to these games, the core of the gameplay, the puzzles are good, then it has some merits, right? Akira Targo, the puzzle master of the previous games, died in March 2016, and thus the puzzles for this game were designed by Kuniaki Iwanami. As this is the first game in the series without his help, coming out on the 3DS in July 2017 in Japan, this shows. Now, while I will say that after the first few games, the puzzles definitely lost a bit of their uniqueness or creativity, I didn't get annoyed or frustrated at them still. The spotlight is certainly being shined on them here, as the rest of the game is such garbage that the flaws are shown in such stark light now, because every, this is the only thing you can latch onto. I would say I found 70% of these puzzles too easy, too obvious, or, or just 
brain dead for anyone that played any previous Layton game. There is nothing new here. They even bring in the classic Hanoi Tower puzzle because they can't think of a hundred puzzle types. You get your classic filler logic puzzles like A said this, B said this, but one's lying, sliding block puzzles and jigsaw like puzzles, which are all fine, they're fillers, but unfortunately they're the most enjoyable ones as they require some modicum of effort on the player's part. But then you get to the logic puzzles where it will describe a situation to you or give you an image and they're either extremely obvious and spelled out for you like the puzzle island mystery which says the island sinks at a certain time what time is that there is no clear time spelled out and by the 104th puzzle in the game you'll know it should be something obvious and you won't need to know some you know the longitude and latitude of anything so it's obviously that it will be reflected in the water at high tide as even the first hint says try to imagine the island when it sank in the sea you idiot. The 104th puzzle, this is embarrassingly easy. I mean and there's also puzzles here that I don't feel are explained well enough. Puzzle 70 pencil box took me longer than it should have because the mechanics weren't too clear. I thought the squares had to be all joined up or touching the points of the other squares corners would count but they don't. That's quite far into a game with 150 puzzles. So it's not like this is puzzle one, two, and three. This is this is consistently throughout the game. The problem is that solving puzzles is completely subjective to the player. These puzzles have to be designed so there isn't any pre-knowledge needed, such as the geometric puzzles like the spire tower. You could use the angles and lengths to work out the hypotenuse and all that trigonometry. But a child of five wouldn't know this, so the solutions need to be using clever tricks and your own intelligence. So what may stump me for 10 minutes, someone else may breeze through, and vice versa. I just feel the overall quality has stagnated with rare examples of noteworthy puzzles. I remember being amazed by a lot of the first three games as puzzles especially the first game as the methods to solve it were new and novel. Going forward, a lot of the same methods are being used here, and it isn't as surprising. A good puzzle could have a lot of wrong answers, but only one that makes complete logical sense, following the rules, and the rules need to be easily understandable and not open to interpretation. These are called logical constraints. I personally believe there is a definite decline in these puzzles for this game. But it's difficult for me to confirm this with only the few examples that I've picked out from my memory. While it's difficult for me to factually confirm that the quality of these puzzles has declined, personally I think the most noteworthy thing is that I can't remember 99% of these puzzles without looking them up on the wiki. Previous games had some really great ideas. The first game got a pass because of how novel the concept was, with loads of different types to solve, uh, that scale in difficulty and are relative to the actual story. I think most people love the train puzzle from the second game as it required you to get the actual ticket out from the game's booklet and manipulate it for the answer. Now I was blown away by this and it sticks with me to this day and I've seen people say similar things about the puzzles in the first game and the second games online and even the puzzles in the third game which reveal a lot of the story and the twists are great and they stick with people. But unfortunately as with most games, <coughs> Pokemon, if you do the same things over and over again with no variation, then the formula gets stale and predictable, which unfortunately seems to be the case with the following games, and especially with the newest Professor Layton games. I'm not saying the quality decline is entirely Iwanami's fault, but it is difficult to take over from essentially the doctor of puzzles, and most of the puzzles themselves don't feel wildly different anyway. So, it, it w anyone would have failed in this regard, I believe. I, I have to go back to the structure here, as it kills this game's sense of difficulty progression. As previous games followed a linear narrative, and thus the puzzles in their difficulty could scale to where you were in the game. But most of this game, there are six choices of missions in the middle of all of this, and so all of the puzzles need to be the same difficulty, assuming you take any of those paths first. Even then, I don't feel like there's much of a leap of progression from the start to the finish. And it, 
I don't know, it's a strange scattergun approach compared to the previous games where puzzles were clearly designed separately from the story here and there's rarely any puzzles that actually relate to any of the story beats. It's, it's such a shame. I think overall this game fails on each core area and these failures feed into the other areas and make them worse by proxy. There's bad puzzles, the core gameplay, which is not helped by bad structure, leading to bad difficulty progressions. There's a bad story and setting combined with bad characters that leads to an unengaging bad narrative and a lack of interest in the bad puzzles. It's a vicious cycle, and I was so desperate to not play this game whilst going through it towards the end. I just wanted it to be over. You may ask me, why put up with the torment? If you know you're not going to enjoy it playing on, but my answer is that this is a series that I adored so much, and I needed to see how bad it's gotten so that I could be fair in my assessment and to not be blinded by nostalgia. Perhaps they can learn something from this going forward with a new game. It made me sad more than anything, but it also made me appreciate quite how special those first few Professor Layton games were.